We all think we know everything about the Titanic, the story of the luxury liner that struck an iceberg during its maiden voyage from Southampton to New York in April 1912 has been told a thousand times before. What else could there be left to say? What fresh light could anyone shed on this tragedy in which 1,500 people died? We all know the ending, right? Most accounts of the sinking end with the rescue ship, the Carpathia, sailing into New York Harbour. But that's when the story gets really interesting. I was curious to know what happened to some of the 705 survivors. How did the disaster shape their lives? How did the passengers deal with the aftermath of the tragedy? Did they allow the experience to destroy them, or did they triumph over it? What psychological strategies did they employ to help them survive? Shadow of the Titanic is the first book to address these questions. In a way, it's an untold story, or a series of untold stories, which I uncovered using previously unpublished documents. Soon after being commissioned to write the book, I paid a visit to the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. I was curious to find out what kind of material they held in their archive. Little did I know what treasures lay in store for me, diaries and letters detailing the disaster and its aftermath over the course of the last hundred years, documents that, for the most part, had remained untouched and unread. The archive had been amassed by the historian Walter Lord, author of the classic 1955 book A Night to Remember. He had become a titanic obsessive, and after the publication of his book, which really only used about 1% of the material, he continued to correspond with the survivors. The documents were a fascinating insight into that night and what happened afterwards. During the course of my research, I uncovered some extraordinary stories. One of the chapters focuses on Madeleine Astor, the 18-year-old bride of John Jacob Astor, one of the richest men in the world, who, like many of the men travelling in first class, stayed behind and went down with the ship. She was pregnant on the Titanic, and four months after she became a widow, she gave birth to a baby son. In fact, in the course of a single year, Madeline had been a bride, a widow, an heiress, and a mother. The death of Astor had left her with a multi-million dollar fortune, but the will bore a nasty sting in its tail. In order to keep the fortune, she would have to remain a widow all her life. She played the part of the grieving widow for three years until she made the decision to renounce her fortune for the love of a childhood sweetheart. That marriage did not last, and in 1932, while on board a liner, she met the handsome young prize fighter Enzo Fiamonte. Infatuation is hardly the word to describe Madeline's feelings for the boxer. Sexual obsession is more like it. After their marriage, Fiamonte leached her of her money, beat her senseless, and ultimately betrayed her by revealing the secrets of their relationship in the pages of a tawdry magazine. Madeline died in 1940, age only 47. The official cause of death was given as heart failure, but those close to her suspected that she may have taken an overdose of sleeping pills. As she left no note behind, no one could be sure whether it was an accident or suicide. As Fiamonte, who went on to become an actor, said of his former wife, Madeline carried her doubts with her always, like her pearls. Survival had its consequences, particularly if you were a man travelling first class, particularly if you happened to be J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line that owned the ship. By taking his place in a lifeboat, he effectively destroyed his life. He was pillowed in the press, labelled J. Brute Ismay, ostracised by society, and became, in the words of his granddaughter, a frozen corpse. But to what extent was he culpable in his own downfall? Did he actually choose to make himself a scapegoat for the whole tragedy? Using his intimate letters, I reconstruct the peculiar set of psychological circumstances which determined his decision to cast himself as the world's most willing whipping boy. Then there's a story of Dorothy Gibson, the silent screen star who within four weeks of the disaster made the first film about the Titanic, starring herself and wearing the very dress she had worn that fateful night. The film, Saved from the Titanic, can be read as the world's first exploitation movie. In effect, Dorothy became a character of her own imagining, a substitute self that in many ways was more heroic than the real one. And again, her strategy for survival had consequences. 
After the souring of her relationship and subsequent marriage with a famous producer, Jules Brulator, she fled America for Europe, where she flirted with fascism and, during the Second World War, ended up being interred in a concentration camp. She made a daring escape, but in early 1945, at her suite at the Ritz in Paris, she died. Intriguingly, no cause of death was cited on her death certificate. It's almost tempting to fill the empty space with the word survivor. Indeed, the dark side of survival is one of the central themes of the book. After the sinking, ten passengers went on to commit suicide, and many others suffered from the symptoms of survivor guilt. For many passengers, the spectre of the Titanic would forever cast a shadow over their lives.